All right, thank you all for joining. Uh, my name is Emily Tice, and I have been working in Ringtail for about 15 years. And I am here to walk you through Ringtail today and show you what it has to offer. I'm going to show you just a quick tour of a lot of the things that people ask to see on various demos. Well, here I am. I am logged into Ringtail. And here I see a number of uh, different cases that are available to me to work in. And these are ringtail cases. These are databases in which I might load data for an investigation or a litigation. Uh, before I jump into them, I'd like to come over here to the portal management area and show you a little bit of what it takes to run ringtail and some of the options you have there. I'll start with this reports link. And I'll zoom out just a little. I have a big screen here. Um, so you'll see here I'm getting some high level reporting on uh, the databases that I have available. Uh, for example, I have 32 cases or databases, 28 are active, and I see some recent user activity, some information about the data that I'm hosting. I can also get a more granular look at that, uh, looking at each database. So for example, you'll see here that I can see for each database how many documents I have, how much imaging I've done, or OCR, uh, today, I'm going to be demoing not just uh, some of our current and fundamental features, but some of the things that are on the cusp or cutting edge uh, for Ringtail. So some of those are things like translation or audio. Uh, right here is this ingestion column. This is the processing engine uh, for Nuix that's built right into Ringtail, and it's been integrated for many years now, actually. Uh, it's not something we cooked up in the last three months since the merger. Uh, this has been uh, in place for a long time, and it's actually one of the reasons it made sense for Ringtail and Nuix to get together. Uh, here I see the import column. This represents data loads that are made using a load file. Important to know that Ringtail can do a lot of different load files, not just Ringtail load files. And then, of course, productions. And these kinds of statistics are helpful so you know what's going on in your databases, but also, you know, if you're a law firm or, or a service provider, uh, these might be statistics against which you run your business. So you can download this report or get the information from our API and then charge that back as appropriate to your clients. And if you're a corporation, this can help you manage your spend. I know some corporations have to uh, raise purchase orders from different cost centers in their business. Uh, so it gives you that, that flexibility no matter who you are. I'll also point out here, this column, I'm just gonna sort here. This allows you, the organization column, to categorize your cases. So you'll see, for example, that I might have these three cases as part of one client, uh, the next few for client B, next few for client C. Um, this is the multi-tenancy inside of Ringtail that allows you to have the flexibility as if you have multiple Ringtail installations, even though you, um, you know, everyone can experience it as if they have their own and feel special, uh, but you can have just one environment that you uh, need to log into and take care of. Uh, so if you're an administrator, for example, for a uh, client or department C, you don't see the other two. You do your work, go about your day, um, but then there's a super administrator who can, able, who can look across and, and manage the retail account overall. Very flexible there. We have a similar uh, report right here for each case. Um, this one is all about storage. So this lets you know how much data am I, do I have for each case? How much space am I using up? And if you are in a hosted environment, this can be very helpful because this total size indicator here might be the way that you figure out your spend. You multiply your cost times the gigabytes and that's your, your active ringtail hosting uh, uh, price. Uh, so lots of good information for you to run your business as well as know your cost on these screens here. Creating a new case is simple, no need to call IT. Uh, here I'm on the cases and servers page. Um, I can just add a case, but in fact we're all about templates and uh, ease of use. Uh, so here for example I have a master case that has all of my favorite settings and best practices and I can clone that case right here. Uh, just put in a new name, click through these screens, and in a matter of minutes, I have a new case set up for me to then uh, load documents to and begin work in. Of course, to do some work, I'm probably going to want some help, so I'll create some additional users. I can add a user here, or if I have a large uh, list, I can import in Excel. And then once I have a user set up with a username and password, 
I'll go ahead and add them to a case. I'll add him maybe here. And when I do, I might uh, want to restrict when that user can get into the case. So I have the option to do some time boxing there. Uh, looks good to me, only to work Monday to Friday business hours. That might be something you want to limit, for example, with contract review or outside counsel, or maybe you have an expert coming into your case and you really only want them in by, you know, till the end of the month. You can put an expiration on that. Uh, just some protection for your data access. We have another example of that in the ability to filter uh, access to a case by IP address. Uh, so uh, that's another option we have if you need to protect something sensitive. One more example like that is you'll see here this case. That's a little padlock. Um, so you have a third option in terms of protecting your cases, which is to mark a case as a restricted user case. And a case like this can only have uh, users added by an administrator who has rights to manage cases like these. So this is often used for uh, ethical wall situations. If you're a law firm and maybe some of your attorneys have worked adverse to this particular client in the past, um, it can come up for privacy issues, just making sure that somebody's screened and appropriate uh, based on their location or citizenship or uh, different qualifications. Uh, or just something really sensitive, maybe even an internal look at, at some things going on at your company or your firm. Uh, so I will jump into a case in a moment. I just want to click, uh, point out a few more links over here. Uh, you'll notice Ringtail has an API. We won't go into detail on that today, uh, but this is the ability to pull uh, information out of Ringtail as well as integrate information from other systems into Ringtail. Um, this can be useful if you have other reporting systems or other things already part of your workflows. Uh, we can figure out, you know, with you how to make that uh, a nice integration. Um, and one example of a way to do it is to pair it with this other option here called user interface extensions. And that is the ability to present a screen in Ringtail, either um, right in the documents area or when you first enter a case that provides uh, information from another system or displays reporting that's important to you. Uh, so enabling your workflows and differentiating how you do your work. And I'm gonna show you an example of one of those as I jump into this first case here. So this is my demo case. I'm gonna have a lot of ability here to uh, show you different things. So just know if this looks like there's a lot of options, it's so that I can demo. Uh, everything can be configured to reduce what's on the screen uh, to be as simple as possible for the folks uh, that you have working, so they're only presented with what they need to see to get their job done. Uh, so this dashboard right here is an example of a user interface extension. In fact, we built it, so it's, it's one that everyone can have, uh, but it, it presents the ability to do something like this uh, for all of you. So I want to maybe get some high-level information when I come into a case. And I can choose how to display that. So I could say, you know what? I want to see all the data that I have. What, what did I load? And it looks like I have mostly email, but some other documents too. Um, and I can just, you know, choose the fields that are appropriate here. Maybe some processing exceptions. I get a nice look at that. Who are my custodians? How's my review going? And do I have any language, uh, other, you know, different languages I might need to take into account? Uh, so one of the examples that you can uh, use as how you might present information that's important to you when entering Ringtail. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and show you how data gets into Ringtail quickly. So I'm going to switch here, and you'll notice I'm never going to leave the case. There's no data uh, sort of movement required to get all this work done. Uh, I just go ahead and adjust my screen to show me what I need to see. So here I've gone to the Manage Documents area and I'm on the Ingestions tab. And as I mentioned earlier, Ingestions is the integration between Ringtail and Nuix that allows you to leverage the power of Nuix processing uh, right from Ringtail and have those documents published or, or loaded directly for review. And so I can do that here. Uh, so you'll see uh, if I'm in the cloud, for example, if I'm hosting, or if even if you have an on-premise install but you might be on site with a client and wanna put data right into Ringtail quickly, uh, you go ahead and just upload those files. So I'd browse here to a local file on my desktop. So I can go to my um, 
my sample data here and say, you know what, here's a PST. I can enter the custodian's name and then today's date, which I always forget. Um, I'm going to go with the 15th, I really am not sure, um, and say this is the uh, first collection for this individual on today's date. So I've done two things. I, the third thing I do to process is just check this box. Start ingestion with default settings when upload completes. So we really want to make it as simple for you as possible to get the data up there. And what happens when you do this is Ringtail spins up in the background Nuix cases as needed. It will leverage multiple cases. It will leverage different uh, worker machines in order to get the processing done in a really distributed and efficient way. Uh, those cases are used for the processing and then dropped and, uh, and the results are added to Ringtail. And there are a variety of settings that we can use to uh, manage that, including deduplication, screening by date range, screening by search terms, uh, lots of good options for you there uh, to get your data ready. The other thing that it does when it's uh, processing is it goes ahead and runs an enrichment job so that the data is ready for review. And I'll show you an example of some data that's been processed. So you'll see here, this is the biggest uh, Enron custodian. And you'll see that he had about 47,000 files. There were a lot of duplicates. I chose to globally deduplicate. And I chose to uh, suppress some other uh, reasons, system files, NIST files, things like that. And so it resulted in about 16,000 documents. And these documents were also indexed to be searchable. Um, we ran concept analysis as part of that enrichment process. So they'll be ready for, uh, concept clustering and, and data mining. And then we also are pulling out the people and domains from email addresses so they're ready to report on and actually visualize in a social analytic view, which we'll look at. Uh, does some language identification. It's set to automatically run the keywords that I want highlighted when I look at the documents. It's really meant to uh, reduce the checklist that almost everybody has um, or eliminate even. Uh, that they run after processing before they can kick off review. We want to automate that process for you. Over here, I can see the process files. I had about six PSTs. Um, and in this first one, for example, I can see that how many documents were suppressed due to my deduplication and other settings. About uh, 8,700 or so uh, were unsuppressed. And to click this link, I just go ahead and see those documents. Uh, before I do that, though, I just want to point out right here We've been looking at ingestion. This import option is available as well. And this is the ability to bring data in with a load file that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so important that you know that's there. Uh, flat files are, are available. So, you know, DAP files, OPTs, TXTs, CSVs, et cetera, um, as well as the Ringtail MDB, but by no means limited to the Ringtail MDB. Um, so let's take a look at some documents. So we're moving from bringing data in to reviewing data. And so what I did was I switched to the documents screen here. And I'm going to use my browse panel. It's one of my favorite ways to open documents um, and work with documents. And I'm just going to go ahead and click on this review set here. So this is a set of documents that I've decided I might want to look at. It's actually the, that same custodian that we loaded, plus another one. And I click on the binder name and the results populate in my list. And so here in my list, I'm able to learn about the documents. And we like to give you a lot of visual cues, help you uh, determine what you're seeing right away. So these icons, right? This is an envelope, so it's an email. Uh, the Word document here. Uh, and then way down here, we've got an Excel. Uh, you'll notice that the colors are different. So the color is indicative of how the document's been reviewed. I've done some review to make it look more interesting for you. Of course, uh, when you start out, everything is blue or not coded. Um, these are configurable and highly popular. I find uh, it only takes uh, not even a day before people start talking about, let's produce all the green documents or, or you know, I need to find all my reds. Um, so very helpful in terms of just visually seeing now. I can easily see I have some unreviewed documents in my list. The numbers next to that tell me if the document is a hit on my search terms. So this document has four uh, hits for the search terms I've decided I want to be uh, looking at whenever I review. This one down here, there's a two in the box. It tells me that it is, has hits on two lists, 
my privilege terms as well as my search terms. And those privilege terms can be reused across cases. They can be part of that cloning of the template case. If you have a standard set of privilege terms or other terms, and um, then of course you could add as needed on a case specific basis. Uh, the columns here can be uh, configured, so I can always change them. I could sort uh, by date if I want by clicking here, or I can even select other columns uh, as appropriate uh, to help me with my workflow. Uh, once I clicked on the review set, some numbers filled in here in the browse pane. And so it's doing reporting for me. I don't have to search for uh, different information. I can find it right here. And I can see, for example, that of my 61, 64 documents, totals right up here, uh, 27 are in a binder someone else maybe made called important documents, and I might want to find those. And so this time, instead of clicking this link, I'm going to check this box. They're selected in my list, and I don't want to scroll to find them. I can just click this button here. And this button, the working list button, is always going to show me uh, the selected documents. So without losing my place in my overall work, I can focus on these, figure out if this is what I want to take a look at, and then always go back to my uh, original search if I'd like to. And I can do that with any of these other sections in the Browse pane too. So I mentioned, for example, that the enrichment will tell me about the people who are on my emails. So I could easily find all the Mike Roberts documents if I want to, or the other side of the dom uh, email address, the domain. Uh, so maybe I can notice that documents are flowing to a personal domain, a competitor domain, things like that. And anytime I check this box and then click this button here, I'm able to see those. Uh, document types is also really helpful. I used to run a lot of searches uh, to figure out what I had. And this uh, report back and then ability to refine is, is, is convenient. Um, so I might know that I, you know, maybe have some audio files that I need to deal with, or video files, for example. So the interaction between the uh, selection in the Browse pane that I've made here for important documents, and then the list, is one example, and we'll see more, of how the panes interact and stay in sync. And that gets more exciting as we move into the analytics as well. But before we go there, let's take a nice look at review, right, the fundamentals. Um, so let's let's review these documents. I could adjust my screen, but I actually want to show you that we can use two screens. So I'm going to open a linked workspace. And I'm going to have, we're going to imagine, because I'm only going to present the one screen, but I am going to have a second screen here that shows me my document. Um, a little bit more, I'll, I'll go into this, uh, my related documents, and then do, do some review. But first, I want to show the working list navigation buttons, one of 27. They're going to be in sync with the first screen here. So watch the blue line. This is the active document. And you'll see that as I move on my second monitor, it stays in sync with my list. So I can really get the most out of whatever screen real estate I have. And I don't have to dig under tabs to find different views of the document. I can always adjust. So I'm going to go ahead and maximize this one for a moment. Uh, the second monitor here. I'll move from left to right, and you see this document here. This is an email. Uh, those keywords that we saw counted in the list are now highlighted for me here. And I've chosen to use green for search terms and red for privilege. And I can move from hit to hit using these buttons here. It's especially in a long document. Uh, that's a nice feature. In the center, I can see more about my document, any related documents. I see that it's a cover email, for example, with a number of attachments. In the center, I can learn about email threading, which I'll come back to in a moment. And then down below, I can see similarity. So that enrichment process pulled out concepts, which allow me to then identify documents similar to this one. And I can see that there are two documents, 87% similar and 176% similar. And I can click on them and I can identify, oh, you know what? It looks like three out of four are green. They're relevant. Uh, and I can conform that coding or compare those documents. Let's go back here for a moment. I notice that there's an Excel attachment. So if I click on the Excel, this one displays quite nicely, but some Excels have a lot of data and are really best reviewed in Excel. And so we have the Office Online Viewer that gives us that ability uh, to you know, look at it 
just as the custodian would have. Um, and it does flag for us during processing if there are any exceptions in the document, like hidden rows and columns. And I can use this button, in fact, I just leave it turned on, to show that hidden content, the hidden rows, columns, or worksheets um, that I need to make sure I review. So especially for Excels, I like the Office Online Viewer. Let's go back over here just to the email for a moment. And uh, let's review this document. And you'll see it's already reviewed, so I'll just unreview it so we can do it together. Uh, on the right-hand side here, and I notice I just I put this pane away for a moment. We always have the option to do that. Just get a little more space. Um, here I've set up some rules in my coding. We call it conditional coding that guide my review and make sure my review is consistent. And so, for example, if I code this document relevant, because I didn't make a privilege choice here, I'm not prompted here to say more about the privilege. I don't have to say why it's privileged. So that's one of the rules that's built in. You'll see this little indicator here, the red star, that I do need to say more about why it's relevant. And once I give a reason for being relevant, my coding is complete. Uh, I can move to the next document. So that's an example of what you can do. When I get to the next document, Ringtail remembers how I coded the previous document and allows me with one click to make the same decisions. And here it's only two choices, but it could be many choices, including a comment or something like that. Uh, so saving a lot of time, especially when you use the analytics to group those like documents together, which we'll do in a moment, um, this becomes really powerful. Uh, we can also have other combinations that perhaps we use a lot that we want to save as one-click choices. So some people think of this as favorite coding combinations. And I know uh, some people notice these numbers on the buttons. Uh, they are, in fact, keyboard shortcuts. So if you are a keyboard power user, uh, that, that's a nice option as well. While we're on the coding screen, I'll point out one more thing. We have the coding history option here. So as I code these documents a lot in demos, as you can imagine, the coding on them changes. If I click that button there, I will see a history uh, log of all the changes that have been made on the, the choices here. So that's uh, about coding. Let's take a quick look at redaction. I'll jump over to this uh, PDF file. And I just want to get a little more space. It's a bit of a uh, dense PDF. And I'm going to zoom in all the way, make sure everybody can see. Again, I've redacted this document already, so I'm just going to clean it off so we can work together. Um, Ringtail offers black and white redactions, right? Uh, just as everybody does, probably. The most common are, are uh, familiar, um, and you're welcome to use them. But most Ringtail users are all about color, and they prefer actually to use what we call a highlight. Um, and you can name them to match. So, for example, I'm going to have a, a blue privacy redaction here, and maybe a red privilege redaction here. And it's a little easier on the eyes to just know the difference versus reading a reason off a black and white box. If I want, I can display those names to help me out. And at time of production, I just check a, block, a box to indicate if I want them to be black or white. They're definitely opaque at time of production, and I can dictate what I want to be printed on there as the redaction reason. Also, to save time, I have the option to redact or highlight an entire document. So I could say this entire document is top secret. Or perhaps I want to just say of these 11 pages, there's 11 right there, maybe I just want to do pages 1 through 4 and page 9. And that would redact the entire page. Drawing redaction boxes is you know, expensive both in time and money, so we want to reduce the, the need or burden there. Another way we can do that is with searchable PDFs. This is a searchable PDF, and if you don't have a searchable PDF ringtail, we'll create one for you. There's a full imaging suite in here. Uh, we have the option to do find and redact. And so you'll see here that I've added this panel, and I could type a word, I could do a query with a proximity search or a regular expression or something like that, but right now I'm using my search term list, actually. And it's identifying the words that say appear across my document. So you can see it's on many pages. Um, but I, you know, power, risk, power, if I scroll down, you'll see some more. Uh, I'll go ahead and just apply page one. 
and you'll see here that I'm going to make those all top secret rate actions. If at time of production you need a, a TIFF file, um, Ringtail does have that option as well at the export stage. So don't worry uh, whether you need a PDF or a TIFF, uh, you can sort that out at the end um, and leverage the find and redact that's available on the searchable PDFs. All right, so I'll just pop this out as well. Um, so that is our general coding and redaction. I do want to take a moment and show you email threading. So I'm going to go back to my uh, main monitor here, just turn on some threading, and bring up a few email threads. So Ringtail has the option to thread documents if you'd like. It will compare the body of the emails and see if they're wholly contained in other emails. Uh, so this one here, this is a nice clean email chain, Astro Season Tickets. Uh, there was a reply, another reply, and a third reply. That last reply is the pivot. It is the most inclusive email. And by reading it, I read the content of the other three as well. Uh, sometimes, of course, people reply mid-chain, they forward. So, you know, there can be different uh, patterns in an email chain. You might end up with multiple pivots in a chain. Uh, for example, in these 22 documents, there are 12 pivots. Uh, so I could choose to review just those if I'd like. I can select just the pivots and review just those. You also see some indicators here of when an attachment was removed or added, as well as when parties changed, you know, if somebody was removed from the email or, or added to the email to guide you in your review. Uh, I also like to think about one of the other options in Ringtail, and this is an easy way to show it, uh, that allows you to compare documents. So for example, I can start with this one that I'm on here, and I'm just gonna switch my workspace. So as of now, I've been working with this browse and list workspace on my first monitor. On my second monitor, I've done a view related and conditional. But now I'm gonna show another one. And again, I have a lot of options here. I like to show off everything we can do. For uh, simple use, day-to-day -day use, you can reduce these to just, just the few that you need. But I'm gonna to switch to the compare. And here's that email. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and anchor it on the other side of the screen. And as I navigate to the next document, which is the next document in the email chain, Ringtail's gonna redline the difference. And so I can see here, I'll line it up, the original content and then the reply. And this is useful for looking at email threads, but it's also great for Excels. I really like to see when people have manipulated the data and the values change. Uh, you can look at final uh, versus draft documents contracts, all sorts of combinations. Um, I just, you know, was doing this the other day when somebody asked me a customer question, we brought it up to look at the differences between a few different documents. So compare pane is a nice ad as well. Uh, so that's a quick look at the linear review, but I would really like to show you some of the analytics as well. Um, to do that, I'm gonna bring up a few more documents. It's more fun with more documents. Uh, so I'm gonna go back to that review set that we opened earlier. And I'm gonna switch my workspace again. This time I'm gonna use that second one. I'm gonna add a timeline and a map view to my screen. And this is gonna allow me to bring up these same documents, uh, but group them based on that enrichment that we talked about earlier. And so the concepts on the documents were identified during the enrichment. And right now it's dynamically laying out 6,000 documents and comparing them to one another and grouping them. So I can look here and uh, around this circle here, I see these words. I see the word resume, for example. If I hover here, I can see that this is really just about, you know, recruiting people maybe for internships at Enron, things like that. Now, maybe that's where I'm interested, but likely, especially with Enron, that's not where I want to play and spend my time. Uh, so I might move away from that. Uh, with Enron data, as I'm sure we all are familiar, the gas and power data is gonna probably be of more interest to me. Um, so that's a way that I can easily triage and figure out where to get started. So I'll go ahead and zoom in. And I'm heading right into that intersection of gas and power. And for example, this circle right here is at that intersection. So this is a cluster of 105 documents that relate to gas and power. And just below that in white are the uh, related or next level concepts. 
uh, market, Dynegy, contract, etc. And that list in yellow below is the titles of the documents. So I can see Monday, Wednesday daily report, gas daily report, etc. If I uh, also, I also notice that the pie chart there is, uh, you know, about 50, I can see 57% coded, so a little more than half coded, and they're all green. So I know that it's relevant, all the documents in there are relevant or uncoded. I will click on that uh, circle and my list updated to my working list. And if I click on this first document, I'm already ready to review it on my second monitor here. Right, so I always am able on that second monitor to do that street level view. If we think of this as like Google Maps, this is more of like a street level and move through my document list, right? Always staying in sync. We can see the blue line moving again. So they're selected in my list and I'm working on them. They're also selected up here in my timeline. Uh, so over here I have the overall timeline in the gray background. And then the red is my selected timeline. And I see that those Monday, Wednesday daily reports, I have them more in my second half of my uh, data set, but the earlier half looks like I don't have them. So perhaps that's something I need to take a look at. I'm gonna scroll in a little bit here and just take a little deeper look at this. You'll see when I get closer, as we scroll in, that I can see the individual documents. So those dots are the documents and the spiral is meaningful. The center document is the reason that these documents are in this cluster and not a different cluster. And so it's very common to work your way out. So this first document is actually the center. Um, so work your way out and, and see how they relate to the center. You might also look at some in the center and some at the end. And if those are really similar, then the ones in between are similar as well. And you may choose even to make a bulk decision by right clicking uh, and saying, yes, these are exactly what I'm looking for, or no, these, these are all resumes or all dinner emails. Um, you know, let's just mark them as not relevant and move on. If we look at the cluster right next door, you'll notice that we can see that there are some red documents next to green documents. So that's another way we can uh, do a little quality control as we work and understand, wow, you know, those documents are pretty similar, yet I've made a different decision as regarding the privilege. So if I click on those, I can navigate to the red document and confirm, hey, it's pretty similar. It does have a different title, but pretty similar to these other documents. Let me confirm that decision. So lots of great ways to work with the map here uh, to do quality control, to uh, even seed the map, mark a few documents uh, as exemplars, and then see which documents move next to them. And, you know, lots of, lots of good options here. Unfortunately, there's so many other cool things I got to move on. Um, but uh, certainly if you're interested in the map, we could talk more about it. I also want to show you the uh, social network view, a different visualization that's going to show you who's talking to whom. So I'm going to switch my uh, workspace again. And this time, instead of visualizing the documents based on concept, I'm going to visualize them based on who uh, communicates. And so again, we pulled out those people and domains, right? We saw them earlier in the uh, browse pane. But now I'm interested in um, visualizing that as well. And so it starts by showing me those top five communicators. You can see they talk the most. And I can see how much or and jump right to those uh, sent and receive emails. I can see Vince emails himself a lot. I can see that he emails Shirley about twice as often as she emails him and really get to know how this is happening how they're working together. If at any point I want, I can click on any of these things, just like I did in the map or in the browse pane. And these documents are, I collapsed my list, but it's right here, are now selected in my list, right? These 76 selected documents. And I click on this, it's the first document up on my second monitor, and I'm reading their conversations. So this is a, you know, you can see how the panes interacting with one another becomes really valuable. I can also identify that when I clicked on this, Shirley and Vince are involved in some of those email conversations, but Kevin is not. Kevin's left out. They, poor Kevin is not included. Um, but there might be other people who are. So I can look at these uh, red chat bubbles here, and these tell me that these individuals are also in play, and I might add them into my uh, screen there and just refresh. 
So I'm building out that conversation. I'm building out that social network. Sometimes I don't want to start with the top five communicators. Maybe I know who I want to start with. And so I'll go ahead and start with uh, an individual and their sent email. Again, the list is showing me those right here. And then I can click on each of these people if I want. But there's actually a one-click button up here. Looks just like the same icon that shows me everyone that person interacts with. Uh, so now I'm building out Grant Mason's so social network. And these would be the next people I would look at, possibly collect if I hadn't already. And we have the exact same visual available for domains. So these circles instead show you when documents are flowing from one domain to another. And you can identify when emails are leaving the company, for example. Uh, so that's the social network view. Let me just do a little time check. I think I'm doing all right. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and show you just a couple more um, new features coming for new data types. And then we'll jump into uh, predictive coding. But before I leave the documents page, I think it, uh, it's worth showing you uh, some of our newer items that are coming shortly. Uh, so I want to show you uh, just some native Excel redaction to start. I think this is an exciting item. So I'm going to switch my screen here just to show me native Excel. And I have a handful of documents here that you'll see. And the native Excel redaction tool is going to allow you to avoid tiffing out those, uh, those documents into um, and then trying to redact across multiple pages. That's really hard, right? Um, you know, that one line of redaction, one row in the Excel might become many, many uh, redactions across many TIFF images. Uh, so here I have a special uh, accelerator pane. It's an integration with the accelerator tool. And I'm looking at that Excel, and I'm able to make a selection. And I can choose these, for example, right click and say, I want to redact this document. Or, or, sorry, these cells. Or maybe I want to redact the entire worksheet. I'll go ahead and do that for a moment. It's going to keep track of that. You can see the whole worksheet there. Um, I'm just going to delete it so we can see before. Um, I could also choose, for example, if I pick a particular row, to redact everything but this, an inverse redact. And that's really powerful, right? A lot of the time there's one line of information that you need to expose, or maybe two. And you can layer these to do that if you need to. You could uh, choose to reveal another line as well. So I'm going to go ahead and redact that, or remove that. Uh, so I've got some redactions here. Up here, I've done a redaction with a regular expression. This is a targeted redaction. Just show you uh, that option here. A targeted redaction, where I've chosen a regular expression. Now, I, uh, there are various patterns I could use. In this case, I just did uh, digit zero through nine, just to show what it looks like. And you'll see here that I redacted those. Or I can redact just part of a cell. This is a text redaction. At time of production, you will result with an Excel that has this data replaced with the redaction reason. Uh, so you're able to produce an Excel that's much more usable uh, without the content. Uh, so really uh, valuable there in terms of not having to do that massive, massive redaction or maybe outside the database um, Excel manipulation. So that's a native Excel redact. Uh, let's go ahead and show you some uh, translation doc, uh, translation feature. Uh, so again, this is not an Excel. That's why it says unsupported. I'm just going to move to my translate pane here. And you'll see uh, I have a lot of Polish documents because uh, Vince Kaminsky, the biggest in-run custodian, has a lot of Polish documents. And so this is the original. And over here, I've chosen to use either Google or Microsoft, uh, in this case, Google, to uh, translate the document. And here it is in English. I can, of course, I think I may have done these all already. Because, uh, oh, here we go. We can do the German. And you'll see there's the uh, redact uh, translation right there. Let's go ahead and then show you some audio. Again, I will switch my screen to the audio pane here. Um, and this is coming soon as well. The audio uh, transcription. I've transcribed the document. And then redaction. And this features, I don't think you'll be able to just based on my audio setup today, um, this features the ability to press play. Oh, maybe you can hear it. I can hear it. But either way, you probably saw that green box moving. Um, so it's got that 
karaoke feature. That's how I like to refer to it. Uh, that lets you play along. You can also jump to different parts in the uh, waveform above. And then these are redactions that at time of production will be replaced by white noise. Find and redact is available here as well. I'll just put the word view in because I know it shows up a lot. And you'll see those time bookmarks that I could jump to and choose to redact. You'll also notice the option to correct a transcript if you'd like. So if there's a term of art that comes through um, incorrectly, you can adjust it. And you can even actually do that in a find and replace manner. Uh, so maybe fix the custodian's name across the transcript. Uh, so that's also something exciting. I'll show you one more cool thing like that, which is uh, an option to bring in some Celebrite uh, data from a, an XML um, for Celebrite. And let me just go ahead and pick my favorite one. Here we go. Um, so here is an uh, example of how that can come through. We can see the participants. I've had a little fun with it. It's the Avengers. Um, and if I want to see in a larger group chat, sometimes it's really helpful to just be able to focus on one of 20 people, for example. I can select that individual. And everything that he says, in this case Bruce Banner, uh, will be highlighted. Um, we've got the attachments. They're also sorted out as separate documents here, um, but a really nice way to interact with it. Uh, if I need to redact, I can, of course, image the file and then do a redaction. Uh, so some options there as well. So those are our uh, four sort of exciting uh, one-off data type conversations that you might be interested in. Uh, and I think then I will jump now to talking about um, predictive coding and then move to production to kind of close out the story. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and go to this analysis section here. And to assist with your review, we have both kinds of predictive coding. Uh, the first one, of course, is the model-based approach, the idea of building out a, a model based on a training set that came onto the field about, you know, I don't know, four or five years ago. Um, and then continuous active learning, which we have as well and have had for a while. Uh, so here you have about 30,000 documents, these two custodians. And I've chosen to start with a random sample of 500 documents as my training set. I had, uh, you know, expert reviewers or review them and then created an initial uh, training model. And I did pretty well based on the model. Uh, I identified, uh, you know, from one coding one document, I'm able to identify 18 po uh, negative documents uh, that I don't need, so it's a pretty good yield. Um, I projected positives, about 13,000. But I think I can do better. And so I use active learning to identify 500 more. So this is Ringtail telling me which 500 it can learn from. I build a second version of the model, and my predicted positives go down, my precision goes up. And uh, then I did it a third time as well. So we can take a look at that. Let's just see in the third version here. Um, and comparing to a um, comparison sample, um, you'll see here that I am scoring all the documents from negative one to positive one. The documents are graphed here in this, uh, I like to call it a mountain range, this curve here. And I can now identify at what score do I get the recall and precision that I'd like? So right around here, I get a pretty good recall, really high recall, 80 to 92%. Of course, there's a trade-off between recall and precision. There always is, precision being the number of false positives brought in. Uh, but this is pretty good. I'm not yet coming into this large pile of documents. Um, and this might be that I want to review everything with a score of negative 258 or higher. And there are some really great uh, charts in here to help you with that decision. So for example, take a look at the last two rows of this chart. 65% recall is about what everyone thinks you can do without predictive coding. So finding 65% of the documents you're looking for. And so this chart says, how much better do you want to do? OK, well, if you go to 85% recall, you're going to find 1,200 or so more documents uh, that you're looking for, positive documents but you're going to review about 8,000 that you're not. But maybe that's worth it. Maybe you're comfortable with that because that allows you to uh, declare that you have a really good recall and you're still ruling out a lot of documents that you're not going to review. Now, if you want to go all the way to 95%, you get another 600, you know, 1,200 plus 600 uh, to 1,800, 
documents that are positive, but you're going to review you know, 21,000 total negatives, uh, false, pes false positives, uh, that's probably not worth it. And so you can use these different columns to cost out the different models and figure out what's appropriate for you. Of course, if you'd like, you don't have to do all that work up front to identify what you want to do. You can actually go ahead and use continuous active learning. And that has a very similar idea in that we're going to score documents from negative one to positive one. But we can just get going. We don't have to do a training set. We just go ahead and configure our training here and learn on a regular basis. And so here I'm saying I have a, that uh, same field we've been using all along, the relevance field, and I'm pointing out the relevant, the positive choices and the negative choices. I say how often I'd like to learn and when I'd like to begin. And there's a full assignment or batching system in Ringtail that will adjust as needed. Then if I've also pulled a comparison sample, I know that I'm looking for about 6,000 positives in the population, and it tells me how well I'm doing. This is so easy to set up that many people just use it on every single review. Uh, I know I'm short on time, so I'm going to jump quickly to, uh, let's imagine that review is done. Actually, I'll imagine review is done. I'll just check that on my review dashboard. So I do have a dashboard here that allows me to see what percentage of documents are reviewed, how individual reviewers are doing. Um, you can see, for example, JR likes to code all his documents as privileged. Maybe I want to talk to him about that. Uh, but let's imagine I'm ready to produce. I'll just go back over here to Productions, and I'll create a production. I set my numbering here. I set my sort down below. I can choose the redactions here. Remember I said I can check a box to make them black or white. I set my footers, and I can adjust my width. If I have a really long footer, for example. And then here I'm able to break out the production. So if my production requires that certain things are produced in native, certain things are produced in image, I just build out this, I like to call it a recipe for the production. I just add a rule here, indicating what I need for that, and point Ringtail at those documents. Very simple. We have some quality checks that then go ahead and check that work. And I'll refresh here and it says, uh-oh, you have two documents you want to produce natively but they have uh, annotations. So it's really trying to help you out uh, so that you don't have to redo the production over and over. Once you're done, you lock the production. I get these numbers right here. And you can export them with various uh, load files. So as you can see, multiple load file types, including one that uh, can hyperlink to the documents that are exported with the load file. I want to show you one more thing. And I'm going to see if we have any questions. We don't have any questions. So I'm going to go ahead and show you the last thing. Um, which is the fact that Ringtail has expanded its scope because we've realized that people are working in Excel and SharePoint and other platforms to track a lot of the information that relates to e-discovery or investigations. And that might very well be better leveraged inside of Ringtail. And so Ringtail has always had a model around documents. But we want to enable you to have other models, such as evidence management or fact finding, and designate what's important to you to track there. And then you can link back to the documents. So for example, if I choose evidence management, I will be able to pick out my evidence items. So here I can say, for example, here are the fields I've decided are important to track about evidence. And I can find all those evidence items. And here, instead of seeing uh, documents in my list, I see these various items and the information I've chosen to track about them. And in fact, I can also relate them to other items. So this PST, for example, that I processed for this individual, I can see who the custodian is. I can see the documents that related. I can see that it came in on a hard drive. And that's because I decided these are the things I want to track. I click on the hard drive. And I see information about that. And this is just one example. I could very well be tracking over here events in the case as a chronology, and then the players, you know, what they knew about the event, and linking to the documents that demonstrate that. Uh, so you can profile individuals, you can build a, a fact finding chronology, 
anything at all that you'd like to model in this way, um, but using all the same screens that you're used to in Ringtail, and bringing that all together in one place. All right. Well, thank you all very much for joining, and uh, feel free to, you know, always sign up again if you'd like to see another run through. I know we move a little fast.